Hey, this is Brandon McManus, Denver Broncos Super Bowl champion, and you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, whenever you're listening and tuning in. Welcome back to The Scoop. This is Season 5, Episode 14. I'm John DiCarlo, and Graham Foley's with me today. Just, just, a, me. just the two of us. Just the two of us. Uh, Kyle is away from work. Uh, Sam has some other duties here as a student at Temple, uh, doing some stuff over at WHIP. So just the two of us today. we got a lot of stuff to get to. We will wrap up that debacle of a football game, Temple's 63-21 loss to Central Florida. Basketball media day was today. we got some audio for you, some conversation about that, and uh, uh, plenty of mailbag questions for you. Graham, what's up? Not too much. It's been a it's been a long week. I'm very tired, but I'm always it's, tired. It's Tuesday. Yeah, you are. You're. Yeah, it's it's, it's Tuesday, lemon. You're twenty. <laughs> what a great show. <laughs> you're twenty one, right? Yeah, I'm not really tired. I'm sure. I'm sure if I experienced you know your level of tired, I'd realize I'm not really tired. So many. You're but, too, uh, way 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 too young. To this be tired. semester is probably the hardest one of my entire four years here, and then. You know, next semester I'm going to be able to kind of ride it out. Why you say that? Just classes, classes, just general responsibilities. Yeah, because it's 35 hours the internship, and then um, capstone on top of it. I'm yeah. going to be in West Philly tomorrow morning for a class, so it's it's a lot. You're going to pull through it though. I feel yeah, like. thank you. I appreciate that. How little sympathy would Kyle have for you if he was here right now? Oh, so so I wouldn't be bringing this up if Kyle was here. Because I'm afraid. So you would say he's intimidating you? Yes, absolutely. And now you're a little bit more free to talk today. I, I think I'm more afraid of Kyle than most people in my life. I don't think there's a single oh, person God, that intimidates gonna, he, me more. He's going to love hearing that. <laughs> and That's he's going to come back next week or what does he come back? He's coming back next week or two weeks. He's going to. I didn't even know he was gone. He's going <laughs> to. Oh, <laughs> and that will strife on the scoop staff. <laughs> that sounded a, a lot meaner than I meant it. We'll uh, we'll send him the, the the audio file. He'll listen and he'll he'll take exception to that. So, <laughs> um, let's get into uh, before we get to, to basketball in the mailbag. We'll talk about football here. So we now can safely say that Temple at five and three and two and two overall in the conference uh, has not passed the test. Playing two of the best teams. I mean, to me, I mean, you could go back and forth about. Memphis, I guess you'd have to say there are three or four or five really good teams in the league in terms of uh, obviously SMU is undefeated. Memphis, they're going to get their moment on the national stage. UCF reminded everybody they're still a very, very good football team. They have a true freshman at, at quarterback, and both of their losses have been on the road. That was maybe one thing that might have given Temple fans pause and say, okay, you know, maybe they make some mistakes on the road. Maybe Dylan Gabriel can get rattled on the road. And, um, they remind everybody they're a very good team with a lot of great skill position players. And Temple obviously has beaten Memphis, lost to SMU, uh, lost to UCF. Uh, they've still got to go and play a very good Cincinnati team. Even, I mean, Tulane has even gotten better. Uh, even USF, their next opponent, has gotten better. They went 3-1 and one in October, but now they're 5-3. and three. They've got to get healthy on Saturday. They did not have Ifan Maje at defensive tackle. They did not have Matt Hennessy at center. We didn't know that until just before... Uh, opening kickoff and they've been without Benny Walls for three weeks uh, but again 63-21 hard to kind of remember or easy to forget that this was once a one a one touchdown game UCF just blows everything wide open and destroys Temple with a 28 point third quarter you can see a lot of things you can see that the players after the game are talking about players only meeting uh, you can see you can see a talent gap let's be honest mm-hmm. When Adrian Killens hits a hole, he's gone. Right. When Otis Anderson hits a hole, he's gone. They didn't have their leading rusher in this game uh, in McCray. Um, Dylan Gabriel, true freshman, played really well. Um, and, uh, yeah, there are some, there are some holes there. Uh, perfect – well, I don't know if it's a perfect time for a bye. I guess they would say right. it's a perfect time for a, a sort of a bye. They're off this Saturday. Don't play again until next Thursday down in Tampa. But – uh, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. Okay, and at, at five and three, yes, there's they would need a ton of help to win the East and play for a conference championship. Otherwise, they're headed for you know they'll get bowl el- eligible. They'll beat they'll beat UConn. They'll probably be Tulane. We shouldn't assume anything, but mm-hmm. and then they're going to end up in your average run of the mill bowl wherever it is, wherever yeah. they can get fans to. But 
Can they get this thing, in your estimation, can they get this thing turned around? But what you saw on Saturday, did it damage you enough as a reporter to say, oh, you know, is this cuts to the core in terms of coaching, in terms of team chemistry, or is this just a, I don't want to say a blip that they can mm -hmm. overcome because they were supposed to be a good team this year. This is a game that you wanted to win. Can they overcome this, or does this hit at some more core issues that are more deeply concerning? Well, I think when you're playing in the American you know, it's really just it's all, kind of all or nothing. It's either you win the conference and you have a chance at a really great bowl game, possibly New Year's Six or just something, or you're just back to one of those mediocre bowls that they played in the last few right. years. And so I think that... We will have to explain that to fans again <laughs> when yeah. bowl selection comes around. It's not, yeah, it's not their fault. It's it's the conference. And so I, I think that, you know, it, you can't really come back from that because that this game kind of cemented, in my view, that they're not going to make make it to the... Uh, to the conference championship game. It's going it's to be very, very unlikely uh, because that team doesn't look like the team that's going to be able to beat Cincinnati on the road at all. Um, and even if they do, of course, you need some help that way. So I would say that in that regard, with what the season could have been um, when they when they beat Memphis, when they beat Maryland, when you, when you thought this was a team that could definitely compete for the conference, uh, UCF having what appeared to be a down year, um, that I think is gone. And it does it does hit at some fundamental issues. It's still the first year of Rod Carey's tenure. I, I think that they had such a good start that you you know you thought he'd take this talent and kind of go up, but there are going to be different issues that come about just from the transition. I think you're starting to see a little more of that. Um, so I you know I, I don't it's not a lost season. They're still going to make a bowl game, like you said. But right. the goals that they once had, I think after that game, not only is it just not mathematically you know probable, it just doesn't look like this is a team that has the ability to do it. What's the biggest area of concern for you? I know there's more than one, but if you had to pinpoint one, yeah, one thing that I I wasn't I wasn't worried too much about quarterbacking as the season uh, as the season progressed and teams started and people started to call out Anthony Russo's play. I I kept kind of staying on the ship that it wasn't really his fault. I think it's starting to get concerning that the offense is not really letting him throw the ball deep. That's not really kind of utilizing him the best ways, and you wonder what they're seeing from Russo if. Todd Santeo's still coming in on these packages, um, and if they're it, even when they were down so big, it was a lot of dump off passes, a lot of screen passes. It didn't seem like much imagination with the offense. That I wonder why they're not kind of letting their gunslinger, you know, go out that way. I mean, he did have the seventy-five yarder to Mac, which did. I thought uh, I thought that play by Brandon Mac was an NFL type of play. Yes. Our buddy Fran Duffy, who works with the Eagles, had, had chimed in on Twitter and said, you know, track the ball over his shoulder. He was clearly interfered with on that on that play. That was a pretty throw. Put it right there. I don't put as much stock into his two interceptions in the second half. Yeah. I think he was. I think he was pressing. I, I think you've got. You know, if Matt Hennessy plays, I don't. I don't think this game is as bad as it is. Mm -hmm. Do they still lose? Probably. If Ifamaje plays, I, I don't think it's as wide open as it is. If Benny Walls plays, I don't think it's as wide open as it is. But. Um, for me, I think one of the one of the greater area of, areas of concern, in addition to getting healthy, is they make nothing happen on special teams. Now, now they did get a fumble recovery on Saturday, and that was but, massive at that point. Sure, in the game, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But last year, and I I'm not doing this to to kick up the fanish uh, Ed Foley argument, and I, I respect Ed. We've talked about this before. I think there are two sides to this. If Matt Rule had gotten a job with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or the Jets, Ed's going with him. Um, Ed had his opportunity to leave when Rod got here. I understand why Ed was ticked if you know if he's being moved off the field and he was going to be in a player development role or whatever it was. I understand why he left. Hey, he's he's now on the staff of an undefeated nationally ranked football team. So yeah, it worked out uh, for him. Worked out for him. I'm sure he he misses Philly, but um, he did a good job. You know what? Whether it was some coaching, more players, vice versa, whatever. Temple had five block kicks and six special teams touchdowns last season. They're at zilch in both of those categories right now. Now, they have gotten the long snapping figured out. Adam Barry's punting better. Will Mobley was non-factor on Saturday. Didn't attempt a field goal. Didn't come down to that. But, you know, Isaiah did pop off a, a you know a bigger return, but... They're just they're not making anything happen there now. Over the past couple of weeks, they've started to rush the punter more, um, but they don't have that going for them right now. They can't. In the past, they've been able to get something going on special teams, or maybe the offense is stagnant, or maybe the defense is stagnant, and special teams like flips a switch for them, and they're not getting that this year. Um, I talked to Rod Carey about that on Monday's American uh, Coaches Teleconference. There was no Tuesday media availability this week, so. Asked him about that, like, 
just if, if he's seeing anybody on film, if anybody's to kind of starting to turn the corner, he talked about how, you know, we earlier in the call, he said, you know, we have tried to rush the punter a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, I just kind of asked him, you know, is there anything that's common on special teams? Yeah, and and uh, and here's what he said. It's kind of you know, kind of like a, one of those answers. Like it's not for lack of trying, but this is what Rod had, had said to me when I asked him that question on the call. Yeah, well, special teams wise, I certainly feel like we've come a long ways. We're um, playing well, special teams wise, and I thought Saturday was the first time that we did affect the game. Uh, you know, we got a fumble recovery there by getting down in front of somebody and covering down, which is a fundamental thing. And then we were close uh, on on a punt block. So certainly would love to spring Isaiah. Uh, that isn't for a lack of trying. I can promise you that, John. Um, I think people have an understanding of who he is back there, and they're making it really hard on us. We're seeing uh, a bunch of different things that maybe we don't do, and that's probably because if I was facing Isaiah, I'd probably do some different things too. So I'm um, certainly – not trying to let us off the hook on that. We are going to continue to try to get him going and affect the game in special teams, but certainly thought we did in a positive manner, just wasn't enough on Saturday. All right, so you heard Rod say there, he basically said, you know, this was a time where we, I did actually think we affected the game. Now, obviously there were, you know, way too many other issues. Um, but Isaiah Wright, you know, just, you know, drops again. It wasn't the only thing that lost them that game. It was a ton of things, but... I mean, he drops that one kickoff that they started at the, at the four, and um, UCF didn't turn into points immediately, but it, it just flipped the field position. And uh, whether it's the blocking in front of him, whether it's him just not seeing holes if they're there, um, there's just there's just no juice there yeah, on and, special teams. And Rod even mentioned, too, that he said it's more about his reputation and what he's done the last couple of years, that teams yeah. are just kind of affecting him differently. They're, they're, sure. They're, but at the same time, they're still kicking to him. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's you know, a difficult punt to handle. Um, but he's had opportunities. And I think, you know, lots of times it's a lot of stutter steps and he's not able to find a hole. And it just seems like you're waiting for that big play to happen and it hasn't really happened very much this season. And on the on the flip side of it, when it comes to, to blocking a punt, I, I do fully realize that there are times in games where, like, you're not going to send the house at the punter because if you commit a penalty, that can flip the game the other way. But, you know, and again, I, I realize that it, it may be – you know, maybe fans have been spoiled where it's not an it's not exactly a normal thing to block five kicks in a year. It, it, it takes some talent and, again, some coaching to, to get that done, but they just have not affected anything there. And, again, it just seems like only maybe over the past couple of weeks, you know, Rod said there, uh, if you listen to that whole call, he says, you know, we have – we've brought some pressure before, but it seems like they're bringing more over the last couple of weeks. But when they've needed that, when they've needed that extra ingredient, it just hasn't been there. Uh, but – and again, when you're looking at a team like UCF, again, McCray is out, didn't play. But, I mean, Otis Anderson, the guy who fumbled that that punt, still carries carries the ball 17 times for 205 yards. I mean, they UCF just gashed them all over the place, but a lot of times up the middle. You know, it goes to show you that they probably were missing Yifan Maje. And um, you thought it was interesting that after the game that Chappelle Russell had said, you know, uh, you know, guys were just misfitting gaps. And he said, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, even if I hit my gap, the other 10 guys have to. And I think earlier he said, you know, I don't want to throw guys under the bus. Right. But you could tell he was ticked. Um, got even later in the game, uh, Thompson goes for 87 yards and two touchdowns. He's a backup. Adrian Killens, only four carries for 52 yards, but he had that 48-yard touchdown run. Temple was a finalist in his recruitment. But again, you can see when these guys hit a second level, they're gone. With all due respect to Ramon Davis, he's had a nice – freshman season may still be a thousand yard back but 12 carries uh 26 yards he tried cutting back on that one you know he lost 15 yards I mean he ends up again 26 yards on 12 carries there was still a a half and you know a half and a little bit more than uh two quarters of football where he had time to make an impact and couldn't obviously once UCF gets that 28 point third quarter they just blow the barn doors off everything you can't really have this plotting rushing attack, but uh, Jagger Gardner, 11 carries, 13 yards, did have that touchdown, but yeah, they got nothing going up front in the run blocking game. These guys weren't able to, if holes were there, they didn't hit them. Mm. And um, Hennessy, too, may have been a bit Oh, sure, yeah. Sure. I mean, that goes to show you just how much they, they miss him. I thought Leon Pinto settled down, but in yeah. that first half, again, two, those two sacks that UCF had kind of came 
in his direction. And obviously, if I'm if I'm UCF's coaching staff, I'm sending pressure up the middle too because yeah. there's a there's a big drop off there. I'm still I'm not quite as concerned about Russo. Um, I still think he gives him the best. Ch- I'm not saying that you were saying yeah. that, that Santeo gives him the best chance. No, to he's definitely you, the best quarterback. The package the packages with Santeo are not they're not doing much. Um, and again, a ton went wrong in this game, but I just wonder how much it does interrupt flow. That could be a weak argument because there have been games they've won where they've used him and yeah. it hasn't bothered them. But uh, I think you got to keep Anthony in there. I don't, I'm not sure how much Todd Santeo is giving you at this point. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of like an underrated thing that's kind of come to my attention that like I didn't want to think it was Russo, but maybe there is some truth to it. I think a bigger um, area that is concerning is just team speed, especially on defense. Oh, yeah. and especially in like in the beginning of the season when guys were hitting their gaps, they won with, with physicality, with stopping runners on yep. fourth and goal. And uh, you know, they're, they're still very physical and experienced up front in the linebackers, but once a guy gets an open space, it's just no one can catch up. And you know, Aaron Monroe had that play where he couldn't uh, he couldn't make a tackle in the secondary, and that became a deep touchdown. That opened the floodgates. That, really. that was the first score in the and that you know I, I came at halftime as Kyle gracefully pointed out on Twitter that everything really, over for the inquire for your internship. And right you got there at halftime. Yeah. So once I got there at halftime, that's uh, Temple had 19 or 18 yards of total offense in the second half, and that's when everything broke apart. But you know, Temple had the ball. Uh, Temple made a stop on defense to start the second half. They're down a score. The offense has the ball. This is an idea deal situation um if you're temple and then they go three and out uh that the air monroe play happens and then from there it's it's wide open and it just seems like every play that was in space no one can catch up no no and, and monroe look i mean they i think they they brought him in his depth he was a backup at penn state you you brought him in for safety depth and you know again and i'm not even trying to make benny walls out to be like a, a first round pick either he's been a solid safety he's had a good season um but you know, you really haven't seen Kevon Bruton on the field much. He was obviously he he couldn't play against Memphis. Dressed for SMU, didn't play. Uh, Amir Tyler has played a little bit more. I think he's had the athleticism to play, and now he's started to come around. But you know, you can go back and forth like to, in the SMU game. Should they have given Harrison Hand more help up top? You know, sometimes they did double, and then when they doubled, Shane Bouchelle said, "Okay, we're just going to hurt you over the middle of the field." Mm-hmm. And again, part of it is it's just these teams are really good. SMU, I don't think they have a great defense by any means, but they're they're dynamic offensively. UCF probably has a better defense. Still a very good football team. They may not play in a New Year's Six bowl game this year because they have two losses, but but they've just they've got talent and they've got their their next quarterback of the future in Dylan Gabriel mm-hmm. and um Gabriel Davis didn't even really hurt them. The receivers didn't hurt them as much. It's just mm-hmm. what they were able to do in the ground game really gashed them. But as you said, you can see the talent gap there. So this is now obviously a staff that has to go out and recruit and whatever they consider to be their footprint, whether it's really, again, the tri-state area, but maybe grabbing a, a guy from Chicago, grabbing guys in Florida. And Temple's done that in the past. I mean, Kyle and I were talking about this yesterday. You know, it, it's great. That, again, I'm really not trying to take too much away from Raymond Davis. and He's had a nice freshman year. I think he's been better than we thought he was going to be definitely more than we expected yeah. yeah but you know i think i think we had a mailbag question a few weeks ago and somebody had said raymond davis best freshman season since you know and i think the guy was making the implication that like is he just as good as bernard pierce no no yeah. uh, I, I mean now bernard had a, a, a quick flash in the nfl he's out of the league bernard the knock on him was he, he couldn't stay healthy um sometimes people questioned whether he was doing enough to play through pain but he was a dynamic runner, and when he was gone, he was gone. Uh, Rockwell Armstead, when he was gone, he was gone. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, now Ray Davis could break off a touchdown run. He's a, he's a freshman. There were times early in Jihad Thomas's career where he would get a, a screen pass and couldn't take it to the house. Mm-hmm. But then he got better, and he did start taking him to the house. So maybe that is in Ray Davis's future. But, again, you said, I mean, there's a, there's a clear difference there in speed. And when you're situated down in Orlando – you can see for how long UCF has been recruiting at a slightly higher level, mm-hmm. and they've built depth and built depth and built depth. You look at all the, the depth they have at running back. Again, if Temple loses its leading rusher, there's a drop down there. UCF loses its leading rusher. They plug in a couple of guys that have already been playing well, and, and you can see the disparity there. So, uh, again, they're off they are off this Saturday, and then they play, uh, they play at, uh, at South Florida next Thursday. And, again, it doesn't – Get gets a little easier, but again, USF's a team that went three and one 
in October and they're playing better. So and Temple hasn't had much success in South Florida either. No, no, not at all. So um, we'll see what happens there. When I talked to Rod uh, yesterday on the call, just asked him about Hennessy and, and, and Benny and Ifan Maje. He was like, yeah, no, not much has changed between uh, between Saturday and, you know, in two days. You know, they lost Saturday. The American call was yesterday. So not much is new there. We'll have an update for you guys uh, next week on next week's podcast. We'll know better about where these guys stand with their injuries. Again, If in, in case you missed it, Hennessy was out with a concussion. After the game Saturday, Rod Carey said, safety first there. And I respect him for that. This yeah. is a guy who's got a chance to play in the NFL. Um, Maje, I guess, is dealing with the same back issue at SMU. With Benny, it's still some – they're calling it an undisclosed upper body injury. I don't know if it's a shoulder, a hand, whatever. Um, and the players aren't made available when they're injured. But you know, you're talking about your top offensive lineman, your top defensive lineman, top interior defensive lineman. Mm. And really, you're definitely your top safety, maybe your top defensive back. Now, Harrison Hands flashed a lot of ability. Um, he's won some individual battles. But he also, you know, again, depending on what side of the fence you're on, whether – Jeff Knowles should have given these guys more help at SMU. Maybe he should have. But, you know, again, if Harrison Hand wants to play in the NFL and thinks he can play in the NFL and he's going up against a guy like Roberson or a guy like Gabriel Davis, sure, you're going to get beat, but you got to win some of those battles. Absolutely. You, know, you want to be able to say, hey, I held Roberson in check. He didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Lumen Crump hasn't. You know, Christian Braswell's been a little bit more physical. But I think this is, you know, well, we'll it sounds cliche, but we'll learn a lot about this team in terms of how they respond next Thursday. So we shall see. We'll have more football stuff for you next week. Um, let's turn our attention to the basketball team, which uh, has a game coming up next week. Mm -hmm. They're playing the Drexel Dragons in the the, uh, the debut of the Aaron McKee era. Today, again, we're recording this on a Tuesday, was the team's media day. So Aaron McKee was made available. Uh, the three captains were made available. Quentin Rose, J.P. Mormon, Nate Pierre-Louis, uh, Graham got a chance, along with a couple other reporters, to talk to Josh Pierre-Louis, Justin Hamilton. So um, just some interesting stuff to come out of today. I'll, you know, Other than the standard insufferable questions that get asked by TV reporters. Oh, yeah. Typical. Um, that just waste time for other people. <laughs> um, a cool atmosphere over there. I, I, I would yeah. say, again, we are not by any means, you know, they don't make every single practice open to the media, but there does seem to be a little bit of a different vibe around the program. Mm -hmm. um, there was... A time you and I were both there where uh, it was good, good play in transition down the end of the floor. JP Mormon got really excited and yeah. just good, you know. If Kyle were here, he'd <laughs> say, the say word. He, Kyle would um, say, you can say the word. And he looked around and just wanted to celebrate. Like, there he just said it seems, again. Yeah, he there it just twice. seems to be, again, this means nothing if they start 0 and 4 or anything like that, or if they have a, a subpar season in Aaron's first season. But, um, just seems to be and this is what you'd hope for any coaching change there just seems to be a different vibe around the program um you know they're dealing with a couple of uh, we're dealing with at least uh one injury uh damian dunn aaron said today he was kind of vague you know damian was out of his boot now that was him sitting there today uh we'll have audio from him courtney murphy who's joining our staff and doing some stuff for us i'll have a story later this week on damian dunn another one on damian moore as well um but he's out I don't think he's going to be ready for the opener. Uh, but the group that was on the floor today at certain times near the end of practice, if you're looking at an initial starting five, now Aaron didn't say this was their starting five, seemed to be Alani Moore, Quentin Rose, J.P. Mormon, Nate Pierre-Louis, and Justin Hamilton. When I asked Aaron about that, he said, you know, we're trying some different combinations to see uh, – you know, to see what sticks. But what we're going to do is we're going to play, it's about 11 minutes and change of audio. This is Aaron McKee from today's media day. So we'll play this and react to it on the other side. And then Graham's got some stuff again from, uh, from Josh Pierre Louis and Justin Hamilton. We'll talk about that. So here's Aaron McKee at today's media day, just talking about a bunch of different stuff. I wish we could play. I wish we could play today. You know, we've been practicing for a long time. And really, I just want to see some different uh, competition. Our guys play against some different competition and myself getting out there and just coaching and being in different situations. So it's important. I'm, I'm new on the job. I've been around basketball all my life, but I've never been a head coach before. So I'm excited and I'm honored you know, for the opportunity and looking forward to it. What do you think it's going to feel like that first game? Do you think it's going to feel like the first day of school? Are you going to have jitters? I, I'm sure I'm going to have jitters. I'm sure. But I work better with nerves and, and, and jitters. 
Uh, you know, being a player, I always was nervous before games. I, I, I would imagine most athletes would tell you right before a game is something that they would do to calm their nerves or if somebody might have to touch the basketball, touch the football, feel the baseball, you know, before those nerves go away. And it's just, it's battle, it's, it's competition. So I look forward to that. And those five guys that were out there at the end of practice there, could that be potentially your starting five with Lonnie at the point or is it still kind of fluid at this point? Yeah, we just, we're looking at different lineups um, just to see what works best. I anticipate playing a lot of guys and mixing guys in and out and playing at, at a high level of, of energy, you know, throughout the game. So, you know, I don't anticipate playing a guy 35 plus minutes, but I want to play at a high level for as long as they can. You talk about Q and his role, because I think over the summer you said you want to let him handle the ball a little bit yeah. more. And, uh... But what are your thoughts on his play, you know, coming into this he, um, he has to do a lot for us, just a little bit of everything. If you can envision the things that Shiz did for us, handle the ball, come off some screens, handle the ball late in games, shoot free throws for us late in games. So his role has increased. You know, his game is, is maturing. Um, we, I put him in a leadership role, and, and he's, got, he's going to have to take on that responsibility of, of being able to lead the team day in and day out. And I think for him the biggest thing is it starts, it starts in practice for him. Monty was a prolific scorer at his last stop. How do you think that will translate here? Well, we're looking for him to be able to do that, but he also has to be able to defend as well. Um, you know, in order to get to where you want to go, be at the top of the American, get to the NCAA tournament, you're going to have to defend. All of the teams that's in the tournament, one or two things, they're really, really good offensively or they're really, really good defensively, and we want to be the, the latter. We want to be really good defensively. And, you know, it's, sometimes your, your offense takes some time to catch up with your defense. What's the energy like in the locker room? How the guys feeling? It's good. It's been consistent. Um, it's been really consistent. And um, we're undefeated. You know, we haven't played a game yet. So you'll know when they get, get the cage rattled a little bit, how they respond to that. But it's, uh, and I say consistent because yesterday I wasn't really pleased with, with how we practiced. And they brought, it, they brought it today and they responded and, and I, was, I was pleased with that. So hopefully we can stay consistent with how we practice and, and have great energy. The pair of the Wee Brothers kind of compared our games. You said compare them? Yeah. Uh, similar but different. I um, think Josh is a little better with the ball more. I would lean more towards him being a, a lead guard than, than Nate. Nate's a guy you can advance the ball with, advance the ball to, and, and make plays from that wing position. Both of those guys have foot speed. Both of those guys are in incredible athletes. I think they can be outstanding defenders. And my charge with Nate is you got to concentrate on being the best defender in the country and one of the best rebounding guards in the country as well. And, and he's willing to take on that challenge. And Josh, he's, he's young. He doesn't have as much experience as Nate. And it's a process with him that's going to be day in and day out, just getting him to mature, getting him to understand the game and, and getting him to understand what we need him to do for us. Do you envision them being on the court together? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it, what I really like is how they compete against one another in practice. Um, really highly, you know, competitive when they play against each other, and I want them to take that into the games. You've got three probably prolific scorers as captains this year. Who is that over there? I can't see it's you with the them lights in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you, uh, you know, when I was at uh, Media Day, I had the at uh, the AAC, I had the chance to ask you about three prolific scorers that are going to replace two in Shiz and Ernest uh, uh, Nate at just, uh, uh, JP, excuse me, and uh, Quentin. How do you plan to use them and how effective can they be? Well, the, the style of play that we want to have is we want to keep the middle open and have those guys learn how to read and react off of one another. Now, you know, with Q being a guy that's close to scoring, you know, 2,000 points, we obviously want to put him in position to score the ball. Nate just pretty much creates his own offense. He'll, he'll just go and get it, and I think he has to be a guy that gets to the free throw line four or five times a game. And JP's got to make shots for us. So we'll find ways in our offense to – put them in situations where they can be successful offensively. Aaron, when do you expect to get Damian Dunn back? And, and what could he mean for this team? I know you guys like him a lot. Yeah, I, I like him a lot. I like what he brings to the table skill-wise. He's a skilled basketball player. I, I like to look at him as a, a Philly guard. He's tough, good size, plays at his own pace, um, can score it on all three levels, can finish around the rim, can create his own shot, can make a three. So I like, and, and he's very competitive. He's highly competitive. He comes out of a 
a program. Jerry played with Jerry Stackhouse, and those guys were really competitive, and he takes pride in his basketball game. He takes pride in playing defense. He takes pride in, in, in offensively and taking care of the ball. So that's what I really like about him. He's a He's a baller, as I like to call him, a basketball player. Coach, you guys some 3-2 defense and shell drills and then kind of went back to the zone during the scrimmage. Is that something we can expect to see more of this year? We just we haven't had a chance to really work on zone, so we just wanted to put it in and work offensively and defensively. So I would anticipate there'll be some teams that want to play some zone against us. So, we, again, we want to be prepared for what comes our way. Is Damien's going to be out, though, the first couple of weeks, or do you kind of set to see how he responds? Yeah, it's a, to, for me, it's a wait-and-see thing. Everybody heals different. Um, he's coming along at a, at, a, at a good pace, good rate. And, you know, hopefully it, it heals sooner than later. Uh-huh. That's my hopes. But I don't want to rush him because he has a long, bright future ahead of him. Have you thought about your calling card yet as a coach? I mean, you, gonna, you know, Jay's known for his suits. <laughs> Thought about this? I don't know. You gotta let me get a year under my belt. I don't. I don't know. I'll let you guys decide what my my calling card is. But I, I know I want to um, be able to coach a team that that's prepared and, and that plays hard and, and compete um, on a nightly basis. Hey Aaron, in, in preparation for the first time, you talked to Coach Cheney or Coach L. Or, uh, coach it was L. funny. I, I talked to Coach, mm-hmm. and bef- leading up to this, it was long conversations about basketball and really you know what he said to me love your players love your guys be supportive and that was pretty much it and I was I'm not gonna say I was shocked because that's really always been him he's a he's allowed when you get them cameras in front of him he's a loud mouth and he likes to entertain you know he likes to entertain but behind the scenes that's what you get from him and um it was just like wow like you know I get a chance to sit in that seat that Coach Cheney sat in, that Coach Dunphy sat in. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, they, they loved their players and they cared about their players. And that's how I want to be. So I don't I, to go back to your, your question, I, I, I don't know what, what my style is going to be, Coach. I might be up and down the sideline, hands up, <laughs> suit off, shirt, you know, tie out. I, I don't know. I'll, I guess I'll figure it out as it goes. Is, is that intimidating, though? Is it intimidating or is it – it's such a huge honor given that, you know, like you look at Cheney and you look at Dumpy and, and these are guys that had such a huge impact on your life and yeah. your career. I mean, what does that feel like? Is it, is it- <laughs> it's, honestly, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult because those guys have set the standard so high. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you eclipse that? I, I don't know. I just want to make those guys proud. And I know what's going to make those guys proud is, is me working these guys and getting them to be good basketball players but most importantly, getting them to become good, productive citizens. And I think that'll make those Coach Chain and Coach Dunf proud of what I'm doing. And where's Damian Moore's game at at this point? He's shown flashes. He's had a couple of good games. He's kind of struggled with his consistency, but he's still a guy that's 6'10". He's got some skill. Where is his game right it's, now? It's coming. I've been pleased with his, his progress throughout the summer. I'm looking forward to seeing you know him play against different competition. He has a skill set that he can help us with, help this team with. So. You know, I, con- I want to continue to make sure not just Damian, but all of our guys stay confident in their abilities. I'm going to support them, um, and all I ask of, of them to do is just play hard and, and defend. Do you know anything about Jake's status yet, about whether he's going to? No, I, I wish I wish I had an answer for you guys with that one, but I'm not sure at this point. Ty's probably sitting out this year. Same. Same thing. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Hey, coach, would you uh, mention? I, I know there were some great questions about Shady and Coach Al mm-hmm. and Dove. My question to you is, what do you feel like, out of the three, did you learn from them between growing up as a kid in Philadelphia and then eventually coach, and then even someone like Larry Brown? What did you learn from any of them? I would say honesty. I would say integrity. Um, they at the top of the food chain when it, when it comes to those things. I just... I just I thought those guys were really transparent with how they handled their players and their, and their programs. And again, that's, that's how I want to be. You know, I know this being a college basketball coach can turn into a slippery slope at times. But I, for the most part, whenever I'm in front of you guys, you ask me a question, I want to try to answer it as best as I can. And I want to do the same with my players. Just be transparent with them. Be transparent with you guys. Two more questions for Coach. I'm bring in Additions to Monty and Jimmy Ferry to your staff. You know Chris pretty well. Mm-hmm. Those two new guys on the bench, what they brought so far, what's it been like with them in practice? I've been around those guys. I've mm-hmm. been around Jimmy, coached with Jimmy. Jimmy was here as a graduate assistant um, under Dunf, so we worked together, and I watched him, watched him work. Great energy, competitive, 
loves the game, you know, is a basketball junkie. My and I grew up here in Philadelphia, Sunny Hill League. I know his family, he knows my family. We grew up under the same people. He loves basketball. And so that's what you want. I want basketball guys. I want guys that just want to talk basketball, who want to get better, who want to help these guys get better. And we're all thinking the same thing. We're all on the same page. They can come in here. I can leave out. They can come in here and give you the same speech. They laugh at me all the time, but they could give this, you know, the same speech. So that's what I like. I think we got a good synergy. We got a good connection as a, as a group. And we'll know what we, we're made of come November 5th. All right, so there you get a slice of Aaron McKee as he's, again, a, a week away from starting his career as the head coach here. And, again, you get some of the standard what type of head coach are you going to be questions and all that stuff, and which I get. It's understandable. But I, I thought there were some, some interesting responses there. Um, I think Monty Scott, a lot of people think that Monty Scott can bring a lot to this program. We had a chance to watch him today. Mm -hmm. He can shoot from the perimeter, can score in a lot of different ways. When you ask Aaron about Monty Scott, he says, yeah, he also has to be able to defend well. And yeah. I think that's Aaron kind of being old school and saying, like, we know you can score. I'm not going let to let you let up on on defense. We talked about Damian Dunn. When you ask him about Damian Dunn, his eyes light up. They really, really, really like this kid. Um, you know, Again, if you missed the quote there, one of the things he said was, I, I like to look at him as a Philly guard. He's tough, good size. Plays at his own pace, can score on all three levels, can finish around the rim, can create his own shot, can make a three. And he's very competitive. He's highly competitive. He went on to talk about how he was in Jerry Stackhouse's AAU program. He's a baller, as I like to call him, a basketball <laughs> player. Like they, And again, not to say that they don't like Josh Pierre-Louis. He's got a lot of potential. Not to say he doesn't like the other guys on this team, but they seem really, really excited about him. And you know, it'll, it would be great, obviously, for them. If they can get him for Thanksgiving, if they can get him for Orlando uh, against Maryland, that's a chance where we got a mailbag question about this later. Is this an NIT team? Is this a tournament team? It's a you know toss up in the air prognost prognostication question at best. But um, I think he's going to play a huge role for this team, and it's kind of forgotten about right now because a lot of people focus their energy on Josh Pierre Louis, which I get. Mm -hmm. But he really his his eyes light up when he when he talks about Damian and when he's calling somebody a Philly guard. And, and Dame's from North Carolina by way of, well, he's you know, playing his high school ball in Georgia by way of North Carolina. That's a, a, a huge compliment to him. Yeah, and this, in this season we kind of know going in with, you know, with Monty Scott, with Damian Dunn, with uh, Josh Perlewey, that it's really going to be about those kind of new guys and how they're able to kind of take the court. It doesn't help that he's not going to be in the first few games, but you know, if you get him for maybe USC, maybe Maryland, it's still you know, good enough time to get back into the court and into the swing of things. Uh, that could be massive. And I think the team will really only go as far as those three guys develop. Yeah, uh, and another thing, again, in case you missed it, only heard part of the, only heard part of the audio there, when I asked him about Damien's injury, he said, for me, it's a wait-and-see thing. Everybody heals different. He's coming along at a good pace, good rate, and hopefully it heals sooner than later. That's my hope, but I don't want to rush him because he has a long, bright future ahead of him. So you really like him a lot. You had a chance to talk to Josh Pierre-Louis. I heard the, the tail end of the interview. Mm -hmm. um, Josh was a little banged up at practice today, but said he's okay, right? Yeah, he, he didn't even say – like I, I, I asked him if he was banged up, and he didn't even say it was any injuries. He just said it was rest, and it was just simply rest, and he'll be practicing before Tuesday. I think he said he'll definitely play on Tuesday against, uh, against Drexler. But yeah, he was great. I mean, he's he's very much like Nate, and we all kind of know his, his energy from what you've seen in different interviews and stuff like that. Um, but he just talked about how much he loves playing with these guys and how happy he is to be at Temple instead of UNLV, and uh, and just his his playmaking ability is starting to really take form in these practices, and he's really just having fun with it. Um, we talked about how he really knows Monty Scott pretty well too from North Jersey growing up. Mm -hmm. Monty Scott, when I talked to him, he said he really knew Nate well. He didn't really know Josh well because he was younger, but Josh seemed to, you know, really <laughs> like Monty and uh so he really he liked playing with him and uh that it's it's really a close group and he really talked about just uh getting in there and enjoying it so far. Yeah. One other thing I'll, I'll add before we play this um uh the Josh Pierre Louis clip here again in case you're bouncing around on the podcast here I did ask Aaron about whether they have updates on on Jake Forrester and Ty Strickland. He said uh Wish I could tell you. I, I think part of that is Aaron just kind of laying low. I, I'd be surprised if Ty Strickland plays this year. A bunch of people I've talked to have said that he's going to take his year to redshirt and, and maybe isn't going to pursue the waiver. I think they're still waiting on Jake. You know, we, we saw a, a sliver of practice today. You can see the athleticism. They're not. They're not. Um, again, Jake was in a white jersey. Again, we're not saying that these are definitely the starters, but. He was wearing a white jersey with Ty Strickland, mm -hmm. with Trey Perry, with Damian Moore. Um, 
but you can see the athleticism. I mean, there are a couple of rebounds where boom, he he swoops in, gathers the ball right away for a team that really has not defended well and rebounded well over the last what, few seasons. Yeah, I, I think they they feel like he could help them this year if the waiver doesn't go through and he sits out, continues to get his body right, helps you next year. But um, we'll see what happens there. We'll see if we have a, an update on him. And if you jump on the uh, Al Scoop Instagram page right now, you yes. can see a 10 second clip of Ty Strickland making a really nice pass to Forrester who came bursting through the lane for a dunk. You know, they can also do it on offense. But I think Forrester would be a massive help. If That's they social him. media coverage orchestrated by none other than Graham Foley. Just a, just a self plug. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but a good one at that. So let's play this interview with Josh Pierre-Louis again. You'll get a glimpse of where he is right now. Again, answering some of the standard questions about what it's like playing with his brother, uh, what people can expect from him, and then we'll react to that on the other side. You expecting to play on Tuesday? Yeah, I'm playing Tuesday right now. Um, I mean, it was just rest. <laughs> yeah. Co- like my, my, my knees were bothering me. Coach Ace said just rest for this one practice. So, I mean, I've been fine. I'm getting yeah. back to myself. My, my, my knees were just bothering me a little bit. in the ice tub, you know. Nothing crazy. It's nothing to extent. Nothing okay. crazy. Just rest out a little bit. And do you think you'll practice at all again before? Yeah, I'm practicing. I, I'll be back in the gym tomorrow getting shots up. Nothing crazy. I'm not hurt. So mm-hmm. I'm fine. I'm just getting shots up. I'm just getting a little rest. Gotcha. So how have practice been so far, especially under Coach McKee? I know it's up-tempo. It's been fast. So what, how great. have you been? Uh, I mean, playing up-tempo is a great type of game. You know, I love it. It's a, the way he changed the game, I love it. It's a different type of game. It's my type of game. You know what I mean? Running fast. Mm-hmm. Most of our guys here, we, we can get up in transition and throw lobs, play fast. So mm-hmm. he knows what he's doing. What's your role kind of been in practice so far? What do you kind of expect uh, the first few games? This just to be a, a playmaker, run the team. Make sure everything, the extension of a coach on the court, you know what I mean? Just to make sure everything's right on the court. Make sure whatever blue needs to be done, I make sure it's done. Play my hardest, play play hard, work hard, do the jobs. Just because no, like, nobody can tell you to play hard. As long as you come play hard, you're fine. So I just got to come play hard and everything else will do it, everything else for yourself. How about playing with, with your brother? Uh, I mean, playing with my brother is ridiculous. That's my best friend, you know what I mean? Like, we grew up together ever since I was six years old. I want to be just like him. I looked up to Nate since I was six years old, you know what I mean? So it's the best thing to play with my best friend. I call him my best friend. He's not my brother. That's my brother, but it's my best friend. I love him. So it's great to have him here. Yeah, you were a couple of years apart. I mean, did you guys always hang out though? Together? Oh, yeah. yeah. Always. He always kept me under his wing. Always. Uh, always. That's that's how we were. Since we've been living in overseas, my dad, before my little brother came, now we have a big family. But it's always been me and Nate from the jump. You share a room together? Mm, we don't share a room. Okay. <laughs> uh, we can't do that. Yeah. We, we, we can share apartments. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can't share, share a room. Mm. Well, not growing up, you didn't. Oh, oh yeah. I, I didn't. Nate, Nate, but the thing with Nate, Nate has he's 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 clean freak. You know what I mean? If, <laughs> if anything's on the floor, he'd be like, "Come on, I can't do this. You gotta pick this up." So you know, I have to have my own room. I have to have my own space. Me and Nate have to have our own space. But we always with each other all day, every day. We could be with each other all day. We don't ever get bored of each other. We don't ever get tired of each other. We just. It's my best friend. Josh, heard it from Nate. What do you think is the biggest difference between you two just as uh, basketball players? Mm, we have a lot in common. I'm, uh, I mean, the, the, the defensive aspects, the, the energy, the, the talent that we bring, the, the crowd that we could bring to like, the, get the crowd involved, to get the team involved. I mean, it's, it's, we, we have a lot in similar. I don't really see like much that we play different. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, he's more like... I'm more finesse to the game, I mean, compared to Nate. Nate's more like a get great. He'll post you up, put you in the post, you know what I mean? He likes more contact and stuff like that. I mean, that's all that's really different with me and Nate. But now, me being here practicing with all these guys, like JP and Marvin, you know, he's a tough guy. He's getting me, like, way more tougher than today. Now I love contact. So it's just me and Nate probably almost similar to you now. You weren't originally coming here. Now that you've been here, how happy are you? Oh, I'm happy. I love this school. Um, top of a life. I love them. Aaron McKee, you know. Coming here, you know, coming from UNLV, you know how the coach got fired or whatever. And, you know, most players will come with a second thought. I, I came my way. I'm ready to work. I want to win a national championship. You know what I mean? That's how it is. I just want to come win a national championship with no other outlooks. Just want to win a national championship. I just want to win. And how much was McKee the, really the draw for you to come oh, here? Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. His, he, he called me family-orientated. It was just so family-oriented. Like, everything here is just a brother. It's a family. And I come from a real family-oriented family. Like, everybody in my family were close. He's going to try to recruit your youngest brother to come here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Christian, he's, he's next up. He's really good. He's really good. You know, if I could play with my little brother, I wish I could, but we're four years apart, so I can't, <laughs> can't really play with him, but I wish I could play with him. How many teams he's have talented. you and Nate played on together over the years? Uh, high school, middle school. High school, middle school. I played all through middle school, him, high school. Only when I didn't play my freshman year. I played Nate. I had a year with Nate, two years with Nate in high school, I think. Did you guys play AU together? Uh-uh. 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 Playing the same program, but I never was able to play on the same team. I never played up uh, because I was, I was, sure. I never like, I was a late bloomer. I 
grew from like five one to like five nine in one summer type thing. So I mean, just me having like I was never like able to play up with Nate. So I wish I had an opportunity to. But now I'm here. I could play here with him. So it's just it's great. When I talked to you over the summer, you talked about how much work you put in with your dad. And he was like, like you were literally like, you said you were like jumping into him to like draw contact. How much did that help you? Because you said a few years ago it would be hard for people to understand, this, but you weren't like the dunker or the, the, the oh, driver. Yeah. No, yeah. I'll lay everything up. Back in the day, I'll just. I go to basket. I was five six, scrawny, probably weigh one thirty. I go to basket, get my thing. I still get to the basket. I just couldn't finish. So coming here, I, my first time touching the weight was when I came to Temple. And I put, I went from one seventy to one ninety. So I mean, the work, the weight room is definitely helping. It helps me on the court. You know, helps me get past a lot of injuries and stuff. Also, so endure, just durability. I mean, weight training is great. It got me bigger and stuff like that. So I mean, it helped me a lot. Nate was saying that he's, uh, or Monty Scott was saying he played with Nate. Uh, oh, yeah, we're, we're all from the same city, you yeah. know. Well, so how much that's where we live now. I knew Monty since I was seven, like seven years old. We all went to the same camps. We lived like five minutes from each other. It was just great. That's, his, his brother, Noah Farrakhan, is my best friend type thing. So it's like he was just down here cooling with me. That's my man. So I love him. You know, Jersey, Jersey. Jersey knows everybody. Jersey supports everybody. So. Yeah, and that's he's just, another guy that, you know, Temple fans haven't seen play much. What do you expect from him? Um, Monty. My, my, He's a great player. I mean, knock down a wide open shot, knock down contested shot, however you want it. Playing defense now, he's getting much better at defense. So I mean, just Monty's guy. He, he could be on the lookout. He's a great player. Good player. He's very under underlooked at. Over. So it could be a good year. All right. So again, so I missed the first part of the interview. But what was your reaction to to how Josh was today? I know you covered some of it already, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, that kind of cracks me up that he'll talk about is like, yeah, a couple of years ago I was scrawny. What yeah. he said, I hadn't picked up a weight until I got to the to the weight room here. Right. And he talked about too, like with, with you working with his dad and getting the physicality. Right. Um, so he talked more about just how he was never really physical until he hit that growth spur, until he started playing physically. And I forget who he said, if it was uh, uh, Forrester or Dunn, somebody who keeps hitting him in practice when he mm -hmm. goes up to the lane, he said he started to love like taking contact and going mm -hmm. in for contact, uh, which is something really important if he's going to want to try to score at will in this conference with his size and you know I, I i think he's really just getting excited about being on the court and you can see he i'm, I'm amazed that he can still answer these questions about his brother with yeah you know kind of energy because it's got to be tiring after a while but i'm sure he's gonna love talking about basketball once he starts getting in these games yeah and, and the, the hope here for temple is that you know if if um you know i don't think he's i, I my guess would be again this is an educated guess at best i think when they start the season Tuesday against Drexel. I think that's the starting lineup you're going to see. I think you're going to see Lonnie Moore start the season at the point. I think these guys feel the other four starters on the floor feel like they, that Lonnie knows where they like the ball. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he finishes the year as the point guard, as the starting point guard. And, um, you know, as a lot of coaches say, Fran Dunphy used to say it, it we'll see who's, who's finishing the game. I think if Josh projects and progresses the way that he can, you know, I think eventually he gets in there and we'll see who's handling the ball at the end of the game. Could be Quentin Rose handling the ball at the end right. of the game. Um, we'll see if his ball handling skills have improved to the point where they really trust him on the ball in late game situations. I think that's going to be, that's going to be maybe one of the main unanswered questions. Okay. In these games down the stretch or the last couple of years, Shiz was your guy. But I'd like to see what they can do offensively without him because a lot of it was dribble handoff. Right. And can he beat those guy off the dribble? Again, I think Shiz was a great college player. Congratulations to him, you know, being a G League player and trying to get into the league the hard way. But Shiz wasn't a so much a beat your guy off the dribble type of guy. It was more a catch and shoot or, you know, not to say they couldn't do it, but against some top flight defenders or if someone's just going to double team you coming off the ball screen, he wasn't always able to fight through that. But yeah, I think they can, if they can, as we've been saying so often, if they can have that ball coming off the rim instead of dropping through the net, they can push the pace. Josh just gives you, we would think, an added dimension where he can drive and dish and be a dynamic finisher around the rim. I Just purely based on ability, it's been a long time since they've had a point guard like him. Obviously, We'll see how he adjusts. Yeah, and Temple fans might groan when they see Alani Moore out in the starting sure, line to start I'm sure the game. They will. But, you know, uh, he, like you said, he does know the team well. He, he His ability to make plays, I think, sometimes gets it's kind of swept under the carpet when he's not shooting well because he, he does find guys in, in transition well. He does make some good passes. Uh, he's just got to have a more consistent three point shot or just sh shots in general. And, more, con um, more consistent three point shot, and then you worry about him being a liability at the other end defensively. So, definitely. again, we'll, we'll see what Aaron's substitutions pat substitution patterns are like. 
uh, in the opener against Drexel. We'll see how much of a liability he is there. Um, yes, they were working on some zone today. Somebody asked me on my Twitter account, you know, I, I you know, posted one clip and they were working against the zone. They said, is that their base defense? Aaron essentially said, no. Do I think they'll blend in some more zone looks? Yeah, you're still going to get somebody asking, are they going to go back to the matchup zone? No, I mean, unless Aaron is just trolling us all and then they're going to be a <laughs> matchup zone team, which I don't think they are. Aaron said on a bunch of occasions, it's it's teams are too good. Right. To, they're good enough to shoot over it. They're more athletic now. I do think they'll blend in some zone looks, but he said we wanted to work against some zones, which might tell you, not Aaron, Aaron didn't say this, but that might tell you about what he thinks of what other teams think of them. You know, with Shiz gone, you know, JP can shoot it. Um, maybe Damian Dunn can shoot it. Uh, maybe Alani Moore can shoot it, although finding his shot, you know, he's what generously listed at 5'11 mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in the media guide. I don't... I don't know if that's really the case, yeah, no. <laughs> but he might be anticipating like, hey, you know, we know that you guys have some guys that can drive and create, but if we zone you up and force you to beat us from outside, can you do it? Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you want to practice against a bunch of different looks, but that might tell you about what Aaron thinks of his roster right now. So we'll we'll see how that goes. You also talked to Justin Hamilton, and before we play this clip here, give us a glimpse of, of what, mm-hmm. uh, what you guys talked about, what he talked to reporters about. Yeah, and I think the big gripe that Temple fans had is that he just wasn't strong enough last season. That yeah. He'd be in battles in the paint and just didn't have what it takes to get that rebound or get that loose ball or make a play uh, on offense. Uh, and he does look noticeably bigger. He said he mm-hmm. put on, I think, around 20 pounds, he said. Mm-hmm. Um, and just looking at him, you can see it. Um, it was also funny. I wish someone took a picture of me during this interview because I had to stand on a step to even just be almost at eye level <laughs> with him, just talking with him he's got the size uh so we talked a little bit about he said it was you know it was really just uh, an internal decision to kind of put on this weight and that it wasn't as much from the coaching staff but when he decided to he worked with uh with brady welsh with brady welsh and the, and the trainers uh he's you know eating different smoothies he always has food with him he says um and so we talked a little bit about that nutrition and just how he's put on that weight so we what, can be what am i about to ask you about you personally uh, a food question oh if i like smoothies yes or, oh i love smoothies of course okay. of now course. What, what kind of smoothie do you like being the uh-huh. The, the bland food food smith <laughs> that you are i think i like most fruits i just love fruit so like most fruit smoothies okay. i'm good with the uh the eagles have this big smoothie machine that's like their go-to thing that's all mm-hmm. the players have and so i would make one just about every day last year um banana strawberries with some protein powder which is actually what justin hamilton said is one okay. of his favorites or um throwing some spinach in there but there you uh, go. all right okay yeah some hope for you i'm a big smoothie guy if you're gonna be blasted out at 220 pounds after the break <laughs> hey guys i can do it <laughs> brought some broad shoulders with me <laughs> We're only a few weeks away from your Thanksgiving takes and you and Kyle getting into let's get back at it. fights. Yeah. Uh, but this, that's for later. So uh, let's play this Justin Hamilton clip and then we'll uh, talk to you after that. Um, my biggest improvement um, over the offseason was uh, weight. Yeah. And I put on, um, at the end of the last season, I was 205. I'm 220 now. Mm-hmm. Um, put on 15 pounds. Uh, I got bigger, um, a lot more stronger. So I say, yeah, you look bigger. How difficult is it to do that, to kind of just focus on putting on weight? Uh, I really have to focus on my diet, um, make sure I'm eating the right things, like always eating extra um, of the right things, yeah. you know, um, and just, you know, just concentrating on making sure I'm always, you know, have something in my hand to eat, whether mm-hmm. it's a snack or just an extra meal. And what have you kind of had to throw out? What kind of foods have you not been able to eat anymore as you're from trying to add weight? Um, just less fatty foods, um, a lot more, like, uh, just like a lot more vegetables and fruits, you know, that's what I try to stay, you know, on top of. Any particular food that's kind of been your go-to now, something you didn't eat much of before? Um, I'm big on fruit, just don't matter, like, anything, like, I'm really huge on smoothies, actually. Yeah, okay. um, Like, protein smoothies, um, that's my biggest thing. Are you making them yourself, yeah. or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm making myself. Mm-hmm. That's cool. What's your go-to smoothie? What's your best um, recipe, I guess? Uh, best recipe, strawberry banana. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. just protein powder and stuff like strawberry that? Strawberry banana, protein powder, maybe, like, some almond, almond milk. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, who's kind of been helping you kind of craft this? Is it it's really been our, our strength coach, uh, Brady Wills. Um, he's been huge on top of uh, me gaining weight, you know, he's helped me too. You know, I've been holding myself accountable. And he's another, you know, kind of newcomer to the organization. What's he, he been like? What's working with him been like? It, it's been it's been great. Um, he's always uh, pushing us to be great. Um, he never he's always high energy. You know, mm-hmm. that's his thing, high energy. Uh, 
and he's just he just wants us everybody to be great. You know, he doesn't let us uh, have a, a bad day. You know, mm -hmm. he always he pushes everybody to have a good day every day. Mm -hmm. And so the the coaches were they kind of telling you just you know if you put on more weight you'll be more physical on the boards. Like what has been the kind of the purpose to put on this this weight, and what do you want to do with it now that you got more strength? Uh, actually, um, it's just it's not just the coaches. It's just me and myself. Um, last year, um, it was some games where I struggled physically, and I told myself I can't let that happen this year. You know. And one thing I had to do was just put on weight. So um, that's like that's just the biggest thing. What's it like mentally too? Like struggling in a game like that, and knowing it's just you know something physically that you have to work on. That's not going to be fixed overnight. Um, well, it's difficult um, sometimes, but I know like with some guys that are stronger than me, I have different advantages than they do. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's difficult, but I know that um, there's pros and cons to it. Um, so I just I knew that it wasn't going to be an overnight fix. So I just. Um, just dedicating myself to the offseason, you know, to just get stronger. And what do you think your role is going to be on this team this year? What have the coaches kind of told you? Is anything really changing from last year for you? I'm just, I'm just here to do anything the coaches say. Um, just be that guy that can uh, just do everything, you know, like help the team in any way they need to. And uh, what's working with Coach McKee been like? I know it's a lot of up-tempo stuff like that, and he's talking a lot about winning national championships, mm -hmm. which is a bit, a bit of a shifting culture. Um, so what has he been like so far? He's been, uh, he's been a great coach so far. Um, he really pushes us every day. Um, he tells us that we need to stay consistent um, and hard work. As, like, he has four pillars. Um, and th those are just like the things that he wants us to do every day, you know, stay on top of. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as you hold yourself to them, like, you're going to be great. And what are those four pillars? Um, hard work consistency, um, commitment, and dedication. Does that kind of resonate with you guys? Does it come off as coach speak or does it come off as something that's you know important to kind of you know, think about every this, day? This is what Coach, uh, coach uh, emphasizes every time. Yeah. Every time he speaks to us. Um, so, yeah. Now you're someone who's been with the team when there's a bunch of new guys coming on this season. Uh, who do you kind of expect to wow the Temple fans the most? Someone who they haven't seen before. Monty Scott, Josh Perry, Louis, guys like that. Who have you seen in practice that you think is going to have a, a big role in the team that fans haven't seen yet? All these guys can really bring it. Um, like, none of these guys are anybody to sleep on. Um, they can all, you know, like put on like a Showtime uh, type of game. You know, anybody it can be anybody any, any night. Um, any of the new guys. So it's just um, you got to watch out for all of them. Yeah, and uh, has it been really Alani kind of running the point too for the starting five? Is that what you're kind of expecting going into this game? Well, he's been uh, he's been the point guard for the last couple of years. Obviously, mm -hmm. he was like um, with him being here and with experience. So. They're just looking for him to continue to uh, run the show. And what about Monty and Josh? How have they kind of been? I know, you know Monty doesn't know as much point guard as you know, Josh does, but what do you kind of expect from them this season? Um, those guys are just, they're going to have, uh, it's going to be a big, uh, big year for them. You know, um, both of them coming out uh, new to the fans. Um, I think it's going to be something to watch out for. And without Shiz, who do you think, if you had to predict right now, is going to be the team's top scorer this year? Uh, Quentin Rose. Yeah, and have you seen a, a change in him, or is it just knowing his ability and things like that? Well, he's um, he's improved his shot um, a lot better, but with his passability, um, it's just only it's only improving from there. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, what have you kind of seen him work on this year? Obviously, it's a huge year for him if he wants to get to the NBA. And mm -hmm. what have you kind of seen him work on in particular? His jump shot. Um, yeah. That's what. That's the biggest thing I'm seeing him work on. His shooting um, and his um, dribbling ability, being able to like read the floor. And what does that kind of do for the team if he has that kind of clean jump shot and is able to make those shots? Right? It, it just it just opens everything up for everybody. Um, gives everybody uh, bigger opportunities to make a play. You know, with him being able to do more. It just opens, it clears the whole floor. And finally, Jake Forrester, too, another guy that you're kind of waiting on that waiver for. But uh, what have you seen from him? Another big guy who's uh, really good in the paint, I'm sure. He's just, he's just a, a big. Um, he's a big force. Um, he's like really, he's really athletic. Um, he can he's like he can bruise or he can like you know stretch out a little bit if you need him to. So Justin Hamilton's a guy who quite possibly could be your starting five, whether he plays with his back to the basket, whether he steps out. You know, obviously the days of the traditional back to the basket center are kind of long gone. But um, would you would you take from your conversation with him today? You know, again, we talked to a couple of different reporters as well. But um, you talked about you know the weight he's put on the strength program. I think all these guys have raved about the strength program. But mm -hmm. um, you get a sense that he can kind of. We know he can step out and shoot. We know he likes to step out and shoot. But you saw a stronger Justin Hamilton today that you think could bang inside a little bit. Definitely. I mean. He, you still look at him, and he doesn't look as strong as you totally want in your center. But definitely a big improvement from last year. And I think what was what really struck me was just the self ownership that he, you know, you, you last year you looked at him and you weren't really sure if you almost felt like does he even know how 
small he looks compared to some of these guys that he's matching up against. Uh, even though he's so long, he just wasn't very strong. And he was saying that it was just frustrating for him sometimes after games and when he, when he just knows he doesn't have the strength. So just seeing the ownership that he knew he had mm-hmm. to put on some weight and that he was proud of what he had achieved but he wanted to keep going, uh, that was good. It, obviously, his shooting is something, too, that he's um, at, at times he's shown glimpses that he can really shoot the ball, he can step out, he can make good shots. That's something he didn't really touch on much. He said he's really just going to do whatever role they ask him to. But mm-hmm. you can tell that, that that was the focus in the offseason. It was something that he really took um, ownership on it himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so again, so next week by this time, that Drexel game is, we're exactly, we are One exactly. Week two hours, or three hours. One week yeah. and three hours away. Yeah, we're exactly, yeah, a week week out from that game. So the next time you hear a podcast from us, it will be after the Drexel game. So we'll probably record beforehand, head over to the game, do a wrap up after the game. So basketball is definitely upon us. So we'll have, of course, a, a lot more, several weeks more, uh, weeks worth of, of content coming your way with basketball stuff. Um, not much new on the recruiting front, nothing new on Santiago Vescovi, that guy uh, from very talented point guard they had in from, uh, from Uruguay. We'll see if his recruitment extends into the spring or if there's anything forthcoming there. Again, Temple does have one scholarship left to give to this 2020 class. But again, the opener is a week away. We will go now to the mailbag. Several questions to get to, uh, mostly from the message board. We've got a couple, or at least one from Twitter. Uh, First one comes from uh, C.H. Evans. This is from the basketball Oh, sorry, from the football message Mm -hmm. board. With the recent lopsided losses, how much blame do you assign to a lack of talent, coaching, or injuries? And we kind of discussed this a little bit. It's definitely a mixture of all three. Um, You know, you you start raising questions about the coaching staff when you see, especially on offense, how much talent they have and how they're not really putting up points. But in these last two games, especially on defense, the talent gap was just clear. When you have those wide receivers running by um, Temple Secondary and the team speed that we touched on, I think... If I had to pick one out of the three, it'd probably be talent. Um, Really, just in the last couple games, I think SMU and UCF are even better right now than I had thought they were. Um, And injuries is definitely playing a part. I think UCF injuries is obviously a much bigger deal, losing your starting center, losing your best interior lineman, um, and losing a great safety, too. Yeah, and I I know fans don't want to hear this because no season should be a wasted season. As you said, I mean, barring any sort of major collapse, they're going to be a bowl team. They'll play in a, a non-New Year's Six Bowl, and fans will, again, will go through the same progression. Why did they get assigned to this bowl and not other right. ones? But and it, it kind of shows how far the program's come. The, you know, Just a few years ago, it was about making a bowl, and now it's, you know, we have to make this bowl instead. Yeah, yeah they, they honored the, the 2009 team on Saturday night, and that was such a, a, a watershed milestone moment for the program mm-hmm. because they had not been to one in 30 years. And that was such a big deal for the fan base. Like, oh, my God, we're going on to, D- we're going on to D.C., I will tell you, covering a game at RFK Stadium, not fun. Yeah, Open sure. press box in late December. Really? It Yikes. was something else. I, I can see why that place was such a home field advantage for the Skins, like in their glory days in the 80s and the early 90s. They were, it's like a, it feels like a, just a cinder block, cold environment to <laughs> you do anything. But they, that was such a big deal. People were like, yeah, we're getting up and going. Huge deal. It was evidence of the turnaround of the program. All these guys from one of those first couple recruiting classes, like Steve Maneri, Andre Nebelt, and stuff like that. You're right. Now, it's like, okay, great. They're going to a bowl game. Do I really care? Mm-hmm. I want to see them in a New Year's Six game. I want to see them playing for a conference championship. That doesn't seem possible for, for this year. But what I was going to say is that sometimes the staff needs to see a full season of football to really, really hone in on their priorities and be like, hmm, we probably need more running back talent than we thought. I don't know what's going on with Kyle Dobbins, um, whether he's eventually going to play or not this season. Didn't travel to uh, didn't travel to SMU as far as we can tell. Um, they need some talent there. They need more talent in the secondary. Any coach will tell you, well, we need talent everywhere, but um, they need a full season under their belts, under their system to say, okay, this really, really is a priority. We really could use some depth here. So uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I would say, again, it's a mix of all three. You can't discount the injuries. The, the, the guys that were missing... Saturday were huge at every level. Sure, you could say that the coaches could have done a better job adjusting uh, last week at SMU, and any time they come out and lose that poorly, part of it's got to be on the coaches. We talked with the special teams, uh, so I think I would agree with you. I think it's a mix of all three. Next question here is a bit of a longer one from the screen name, To the Clouds 13. With the recent success of both SMU and USF and their use of the transfer portal, I would like to know your opinions on how to build and maintain a successful team now. Do you use a lot of scholarships? 
Do you save some for transfers? Do you hope and pray for a natural attrition to go to, uh, to get transfers? I can see how it's a double-edged sword if you take a ton of transfers. Other coaches are going to say to recruits, hey, these guys aren't concerned about developing you or they'll just replace you with a transfer. But at the same time, if you have deficiencies, the transfer rules are a quick fix. This can apply to basketball as well. I mean, I think you want to fill out the majority of your classes with with four-year guys and you plug in a transfer, sure. I mean, SMU would be like, well, yeah, we love the transfer portal. That's where that's where we got Shane Bouchelle. You know, um, Temple's benefited from you know, from transfers before, both the football program and the basketball program. Do I think that they should go transfer heavy? No. Uh, but I think, you know, I think when you're filling out a recruiting class near the end of it, now things are a little different. You know, you're filling out the majority of your class in December. In February, I don't know, maybe you get into a recruiting battle where you're fighting out with a, a, a higher level recruit with some other programs and maybe this kid's waiting till February. But I don't think things are going to change drastically there i think they'll always leave a couple of spots Mm -hmm. for transfers because anytime somebody from the northeast leaves a program and is interested in coming back closer to home we get the questions are they going to go after this kid are we going to go after that kid um it's just the question is like who's the transfer is it montel harris who came in and had a huge impact after coming in from boston college or is it a guy like kevin newsom who didn't work out of penn state and there was a reason why he didn't work out of penn state Mm -hmm. so i don't expect yeah, you know, I don't think they're going to start using that transfer portal any more than they would unless you know the need dictates it. But I don't love to hear how you feel about yeah, that. Yeah, I also think when you look at a program like SMU, especially like UCF and all their success in the last few years, I think if you're a recruit who's getting an offer from UCF, I think your first thought is, wow, you can play for UCF, the team that's on the national yep. stage is competing all the time. Um, they may have won by getting some great transfers, but it's made the program better. And I think if you are getting recruited there, you think that you're good enough to play at that level, you're going to want to compete against those guys that they might bring in. And I, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if many uh, recruits have the attitude that they're afraid of being replaced by a transfer. I think most of it's going to be about competing and being on that, yeah, like, agree that with team. You. Next question comes from HBG Al. I think this team is an NIT slash borderline NCAA team this season, 17 to 21 wins. What is the Al Scoop staff season win loss prediction? I, I don't have a. I think probably maybe another time we'll go down the schedule, but it's almost an exercise in futility to do that for basketball. It's yeah. just way too long a There's season. Um, if they're a 21 win team, but a couple of those wins include, you know, if you knock off Maryland on Thanksgiving, if you beat Villanova at home, if you beat Memphis and they remain a top 25 program, now we're having a different conversation. Um, sure, I think you can. I think it's fair to say that they're a borderline NCAA team. That's about where I would put them. But um, I think they can win twenty games. I think they can win twenty one games. I, I think the Americans a good league. I think that I think that UConn will be good in their last year in the league. I think people look at Dan Hurley and they're kind of juicing them up. And I think they're a little bit more beatable than than people think. Memphis will be interesting. I, I, mm. I think they could be. Again, I'm sitting here and we're sitting here in late October, a couple of days before Halloween. Do they have a ton of talent? Yes. Is Anthony is is Anthony Hardaway recruiting splendidly down there? Yes. But I'd like to also see how he blends his talent together. So maybe they're still working through some of that stuff, and maybe they come here as a top fifteen team, or um, well, they, they don't come here. Actually, that, that's right. Yeah, you go down there. Mm. Well, that's a big. If you, if you beat them down there, that's massive. That's that's huge. Um, I think they can be a tournament team, but again, our, our predictions at this point are, are useless. But if you get what you think you can get out of Damian Dunn and Josh Pierre-Louis as freshmen, and if J.P. Warman steps up the way you want him to, if Nate Pierre-Louis becomes one of the best defensive guards in the country and this team team rebounds, sure, I think they can be a tournament team. Yeah, and if you get Jake Forrester's waiver too, which yeah. you know, who knows about that, but that changes a lot too. And I think with all that potential talent, there's so many unknowns, and the, the biggest unknown too is just how is McKee's coaching style going to translate well here? You know, you still haven't seen him be a head coach for a basketball game. Um, but I think they have a potential to be, you know, a definite tournament team. Um, and I think that if you look at those three big games, Maryland, Villanova, um, and Memphis, Maryland's the one I'd say that's probably going to be a loss because, like we said, the beginning of the season's probably not going to be the same starting five, the same rotation as the end of the season. They're going to have to be working out to see how JPL does and how, um, you know, if Forster is playing and how Damian Dunn does after coming back from the injury. So I would say they, they might have a better chance of beating Villanova at home once that team's kind of more solidified by then. Um, and Memphis on the road, that's going to be a Q1 loss no matter what, I think. Right. So, you know, it, it's going to be interesting, but I think that the Maryland game is probably going to be their first real 
test. Um, I wouldn't be disappointed as a Temple fan if they lose that one. And I think you have a big opportunity at home against Villanova. Well, and you have an opportunity to win that game too because, again, that's traditionally now it's a different, different program, different coach, but that's where you snag some of those games in November yeah. when teams are still feeling themselves out. And, again, Maryland's very good, but um, 11 a.m. game on Thanksgiving, you know. Weird basketball. Weird basketball, possibly a, or very possibly a lightly attended game. Yeah. You're not you're not going down to College Park to play them there. That's the type of environment where they could win that game. That's true. So, you know, again, and then when the selection committee gets together, they can say, well, it was early in the season, but if you have a top 10 win and a, and a neutral court, mm -hmm. not such a bad thing. Uh, next question from the message board from North Broad. Put a percentage on Fran Brown being here next year. Again, I don't know what, 50-50. I mean, I, I don't think any coach right now – look, they're 5-3 they're, they're and three overall, 2-2 two and two in the league. The secondary has kind of had it handed to them yeah. the past couple of weeks. I, I mean, I think this is all supposition. If for whatever reason Jeff Knowles got snagged by another program, and again, his defense just gave up 63 points. Right. The week before that, he gave up 45 at SMU. This is not a guy – you know, and Jeff's done had done a solid job before that. If it's a situation where like Jeff Knowles leaves, and Rod doesn't make Fran the defensive coordinator, yeah, I could see him getting ticked off and actively looking for other jobs. But that is really all, all conditional. Um, honestly, uh, I'm going to say 75 25 is here next year. Yeah, but no, that's just whatever. You know, that's about what I'd say as well. I think it's a better chance he's staying here than not going, and especially after I think it was really the secondary that you have to look at as the biggest issue on defense the last couple of weeks. Right. Uh, next question from. Mission Man, one of the very loyal uh, Temple fans out there. Do you see one of the bigs being impactful enough to get 30 minutes per game as a solid part of the rotation? What do you think will be the most improved player on the roster, best with the scoop? And yeah, Mission Man's a, a good guy. Can't give away his identity on the air here, but <laughs> known him for a long, long time and a, a very good uh, loyal Al Scoop listener and a, a loyal Temple fan. I, I think this is an interesting question because Aaron said today that he's not really looking to play guys like, 30, 40 minutes a game, and he wants to play as many guys as possible so they can be fresh. I mean, if if um, I, I don't see Damian Moore, any of the bigs no. like playing, I don't see Damian Moore playing 30 minutes a game. If he's playing 30 minutes a game, it's because uh, it's because Justin Hamilton's hurt. Yeah, And exactly. I'm not trying to take a whole lot away from Damian. I asked about him today. I still think he has potential. He just, uh, I think it was J.P. Mormon had said today, he's like, he's just been injury prone, a little bit more injury prone than some of us, but... You know, I, I think if, if someone like Justin Hamilton's playing 30 minutes a game, it's because he's firing on, on all cylinders. He's blocking shots. He's rebounding. He's stepping out to hit shots. But I don't think you will see one of the bigs play 30 minutes a game this year. And if that's, that, if that's the case, I don't think that's a bad thing. Again, I think it means that Dre Perry's getting some minutes. And I know Dre's a, a big wing. You know, mm -hmm. JP is a big wing player. But again, these guys have talked about team rebounding. You know, again, I mean, when Houston came in here a couple seasons ago and absolutely wiped the floor with them rebounding, they didn't do it with a player that was taller than 6'7 right. or 6'8. So I don't think that's going to be their style this year. If, if again, if Hamilton, even if Jake Forrester gets eligible, if you look at the box, we're going to say, oh, my God, the bigs aren't playing 30 minutes a game. Something's wrong. No, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, and team rebounding, I think, is the most uh, important point. that It's not going to be up to the bigs to grab those rebounds. It's going to be a rotation. And this team really does look like it has a lot of depth off the bench that the rotation could really work well for them. I think that this question kind of goes in hand, in hand hand in hand with Justin Hamilton. I think if there is any big that's going to play the most minutes, yeah. it'll be him mm -hmm. because he has much better uh, a much better offensive game I think than Damian Moore and more just versatility yeah. as a player. Um, and he is someone who I think could be the most if if the strength is really going to correlate into you know better rebounding, um, stronger finishing, uh, then I think he probably could be the most improved player on this team. Um, but you know it's yet to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, two more questions here, unless we get any late ones. Um, next one comes from Esther Boyer on the message board. What do you think will be the biggest quote unquote win of Aaron McKee's first three years as head coach? Is it in recruiting, a tournament run, or a conference title? I mean, I think that one here would, would, would beget the other two. If it's a big recruiting win, you're making things easier on yourself in terms of winning. I think if, if, if I'm thinking of what he's getting at with his question here, I still think that they're going to have to win first, establish their brand of basketball before they snag a, a top 75, top 50 recruit. I still think, and you know, we typically talk about this more along the football side of things, I still think Aaron and his staff, they're going to trust the tape more than they trust 
rankings. Now, would they love to get a top 50 player? Sure. But, you know, I'd be, you know, these guys can't talk on the record. I would venture to guess that they're very excited about, and he hasn't signed yet, they're very excited about Quincy Adam McCoy. They're, you can see how excited they are about Damian Dunn. If Damian Dunn eventually becomes a future pro, who gives a damn about where he was ranked? I guess my thing to Esther Boy would be, what's a big recruiting win? Is it, you know, what's your what's your benchmark? Is it a top 100 player? Is it you out-recruited Memphis or Villanova to get the kid? Um, you know, Josh Pierre-Louis was a top 150 recruit. Um, you know, is it snagging the top player in Philly? I think you're going to see uh, maybe a conference title or a tournament run before you see a big win in, in recruiting. Yeah, and if the question is more about like what's, what would be the bigger you know deal of the three, mm-hmm. I think for one, winning the AAC is not like winning the A10 where it's like a benchmark that you you used to almost have to hit as a, a yeah. Temple program, um, and especially early on, it's going to be difficult when you have a, a team like Memphis competing. Um, and I think Temple fans are all still starving for that second weekend trip, and that's something that you know Aaron's talked about. We we talking to JP Mormon about they're talking about national championships, not just making t- mm-hmm. uh, the tournament. That that's on their mind. That's something that's resonating with them that I think that would be the biggest benchmark the biggest win to say that hey this era is going to be different than the last one that we're really trying to establish something new it's getting that second round of the tournament yeah I agree with you um, next our next and last question here of the day from the mailbag this one's from Twitter uh, the app I at I believe guy uh, Jack Fatika another longtime Temple fan following up on last week's stadium question if on campus is not an option what if 35,000 seat in a non-campus location be preferable to a long-term deal at the link. Thoughts? And this is just first of, of two questions. Uh, I, I think th- these decisions are obviously made well beyond our pay grades, but I think they're, I don't know, if you build an off, if you build your own, what you consider to be your own facility, but it's off campus, I mean, it all depends on what your next deal is going to look like with the with the Eagles. I mean, if they're still bound and determined to build a stadium on campus, then they'll probably so- sign some sort of short-term deal with the Eagles. But I don't know what you're really accomplishing. To me, the, the issue is once you ask people to go off campus, whether it's down to right. the link or anywhere, it's the students saying, ah, it's a trip. Yeah. Or, you know, and again, if it's done, sure, it has to be done carefully. It has to be done well. It has to be done in a way that that you know is beneficial to everybody and done in conjunction with community support i know that not every single person in the community is ever going to support any one thing or one venture but i think it's i think it's either like the link or you, you play on campus if you build a stadium off campus and who knows maybe that's what ends up happening here i just think then the argument would be okay hey, you you right-sized your stadium you're building right. a, a 30 or thirty-five thousand seat stadium but people still have to travel to get to it and it's not on campus you're not engaging alumni back on campus what's the point why don't you go back to just playing in an nfl stadium you can at least sell recruits on playing in an nfl stadium so i wouldn't see the point this is just me just my my two cents as as our buddy mike kern used to like to say Hmm. um i don't know why you build off campus if you're it's either to me if you play on campus you play the link i totally agree and i think that if you do build off campus and it's you know the same problem of not being able to get students to go, then you're stuck with it too. Yep. You can leave the link, but you can't leave something that you built yeah, that exactly. much. Exactly. The whole point of having on campus is engaging the, the alumni, is bringing people back to what's an, an ever expanding campus. And I can echo your points as a student that you know my friends who don't go to the game just don't feel like getting on a bus. It's free. Yep. They do everything. The the school does everything it possibly can to get students to come down there. And I was coming in at halftime, and there's still busloads of kids that were leaving to go back to parties and stuff. That could mm-hmm. probably stay for the fourth quarter if they were on campus. Yeah. Um, um, it, it, they don't want to go down there. If they do want to go down there, they want to leave early. Um, and like you said, it, you can at least sell recruits on your playing at the Eagle Stadium. Yep. Um, there's NFL connections here. Um, so, yeah, there wouldn't really be a point. Uh, Jack's second and last question here. What does the university selling $5 tickets to the home opener with a Temple legend kicking off his career as head coach say about the state of the program and our fans? So Jack's talking about basketball here. Hmm. I, I think it's – I know it – you know, Jack is incisive, if nothing else, and he's – talked about canceling a season tickets and has been ticked off for a long time about the state of the basketball program. I get that. They've kind of, again, two NCAA tournament wins in 13 seasons. I get it. I mean, I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of the marketing department when I say this. I don't you know, work over there, but I think it says that they're self-aware and saying like, we want to get, we want to get fans in here for the opener. I don't think you can just, 
and this is, I promise you, this is not a shot at Aaron. Uh, I like him a lot, known him quite a while, and think and, and hope for his case that he does a, a good job at Temple. But I think it's a way of saying, like, yeah, we want to fill the building. You know, there's still apathy amongst the fan base. So I think it's, I think it's smart. You know, it just knock down some ticket prices. And there was even some action on our message board today where people saying, like, great, I'll swipe 30 or 40 and I'll donate them. I'll take another 20 and um, try to get some kids in here. That's what you need to do to mobilize things. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's smart. I think if you just sit back, kick your feet up and say, oh, Aaron McKee is the new head coach at Temple. We are just naturally expecting 10,201 fans to be at the link for the, uh, the link, mm-hmm. uh, at the Lee Core Center for the opener. There are attendance issues across. I mean, there have been articles done about this, about people just attendance at games, people yeah. like sitting in their man caves and sitting at home. Kevin DeGandhi talked about it uh, when we had him on, I think back in the spring on our podcast or maybe early summer. Um, I think it's smart. You know, knock down the price on some tickets, get some people in and get them to see a new brand of basketball then go from there. I don't think... I'm not thinking maybe the way that Jack is in here, like, oh, they to get, to get fans in, they had to knock ticket prices down to five bucks. I know. But again, I think before you can walk, you've got to crawl, and I think this is part of the crawling process. Yeah, and I, I don't, I didn't even know there were five dollars. I just didn't even look at that. And I think mm-hmm. if you have a full stadium, um, you know, any any kind of uh, lax day school fan that's tuning in to see Aaron McKee's first game, that sees a full arena, is just going to be like, wow, people are buying into this. They're mm-hmm. not going to go look up the ticket prices and be disappointed in that. The only people who are going to know are the people buying tickets to the game who are now are excited to be back in the arena. And so I think, you know, it, again, it's just, it's self-aware. It's it's focusing on what's important. And what's important is bringing people in to kind of see this new era. And then you hope you can sell them uh, with winning. And I think Aaron McKee also, we, we've talked about, is just not the best self-promoter. And that's totally fine. If you're not focused on that, you're not focused on that. Um, you know, with, with the social media presence and trying to kind of draw people back in, he's focused on winning basketball games. So you're not mm-hmm. going to just have him go around and say, come to this game. It's time for a new era. It's time to win national championships. He's not going to do that publicly. He's just going to focus on the team. I think that's one reason why it's not this huge kind of benchmark moment in Philadelphia that some people might be hoping that it is. I think his self-promoting has come in the him saying, I play to win. I'm here to win a national championship. He definitely answers questions. Yeah, we want to play with pace. We want to be a team that the Philadelphia gets behind. I mean, I think that's the the self-promotion you're going to see. He's not this uh, social media maven necessarily. He doesn't even try to live, and part of me, you know, gives him credit for this. He doesn't try to live off of his, like, oh, yeah, I'm friends with or I mentored Allen Iverson thing. But, again, if if there's a better and more exciting brand of basketball, and they can eventually get a march run in them. I think everything else will, will take care of itself. And yeah, I don't expect them to. To we've talked about this before. You're not going to always sell out Tulsa and Tulane. Mm-hmm. Even when this program was coming off of its late '90s run, they were they were still selling out some games. You'd sell out Maryland. You'd sell out. You know when Calipari had uh, you know Dewan Wagner coming in. Uh, I think they were. Did he bring him in? Oh, I can't remember if, if he came here with Memphis or I know I saw him play at the Lee Course Center in high school. Be that as it may, mm-hmm. getting off track, you want to start selling out some games that make sense. You're not going to maybe sell out those some of those Monday and Tuesday night, Wednesday night conference games, but I, I think this is a step in the right direction. I think Aaron will start to sell the program in his own way, but um, I see it as a smart thing. Yeah. Again, I know what Jack's getting at and saying like, oh, it's just no, we got to sell five dollar tickets, but. I don't know what else is what else has worked. Yeah, and I think the crowds can get better over time if you bring these people in to start. Uh, and it's a shame that Memphis isn't coming here because I think that would be a sellout sure. most likely, especially just with uh, Temple students are really interested in what they're doing there. Um, but I also think that you have the potential for that Villanova game. I mean, what if you do get Allen Iverson to be sitting courtside as as this this new brand of basketball you know, potentially oh, yeah. puts up a good game against Villanova? That can make Temple just seem cool and nationally relevant again, and just that could be what you're aiming for. But it's not going to happen right you away. Bring in his buddy Eric Snow. He used to play with and Eric Snow will yeah. fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be perfect. Anyway, well, that'll do it for this week. Again, the next time we talk to you guys will be next week, and we'll have some actual regular season basketball to talk about. We'll be coming off Temple's opener against Drexel. Uh, Temple will be two days away from uh, heading down uh, to Tampa to play USF, try to get their season back on track football wise. So, uh, thanks again uh, for all the questions you sent in this week. Thank you to to Kyle for giving us some space from him this week yeah it was it was a nice change i don't know maybe oh, are we look like into that. doing this more often no I'm just no <laughs> Miss G- you, give, Kyle. giving graham time to, to spread his wings you know and what i clip them I, yeah i just I, I feel like there's less of a cloud hanging over me right now mm. as, as i speak freely and don't have to worry about having a show someone looking over my shoulder mm. i don't know maybe it's time to change kyle <laughs> it's time to look at that man in the mirror 
Maybe I'll we'll just have like a buzzer or something. Anytime Kyle says something snarky, I'll just smack it mm. so it just stops. Maybe we will. Him. Well, maybe we'll have a full house next week. Maybe Kyle will be back. Sam will be back. So we'll have plenty to talk about. Again, thanks for tuning in. We will talk to you guys next week. Thank you.